Today's hadith number 13, Abul Arba'in al Last time we took hadith number 12. Do you remember it? Yes. What is it? Yes, part of being a good Muslim or a sign on being a good Muslim or a sign on one's perfection of Islam or a sign on one's beauty of Islam is his leaving alone that which does not concern him. من حسن إسلام المرء تركه ما لا يعني من حسن إسلام المرء تركه ما لا يعني Remember when we went over this hadith and we said that Ibn Abi Zayd رحمه الله one of the Maliki scholars his name is Ibn Abi Zayd he said that the the the, the etiquettes of social interaction or jama' adab al khair you know, uh, basically the summary of etiquette of goodness is in four hadith. And he said, It's a sign on one's uh, perfection of Islam, leaving alone that which does not concern him. He said there are three other hadith. Three other hadith that constitute the uh, basics of good good etiquettes. Yes. Don't. Anyone already? It's like fundraising. Yes, so you raise your hand. You have to. Yes. The second one is whenever you see something, see something good. So, yes. This is the second one. Uh, uh, he who believes in Allah and the hereafter, let him s speak good or stay silent. That's the second one. Third, don't be angry. Don't be angry. Just a very short hadith. Don't be angry. Fourth, hmm? Yeah, but, it, but, but the, the, some narrations of the hadith of Fariyak al Khair and Yasmut has Fariyak al Jara. Let him show generosity to his neighbor. There is one more left, which is today's hadith. Exactly. It's today's hadith. This is hadith number 13 of Al-Arba'in al nawiyya None of you shall have faith or shall have complete faith until he loves for his brother what he loves for himself. That's the same. That's the fourth one. That's the fourth one. Yeah. That is... Huh? That's the fourth one. That's the fourth one. Yes. Okay. So I was saying that the fourth one is today's hadith, which is... <coughs> One of you shall not have faith until he loves for his brother what he loves for himself. But when I, I ask you a question, one of you shall not have faith or shall not have complete faith? Complete. There is a disagreement amongst the scholars whether it is the uh, here means he will not have faith, period, or it means he will not have complete faith. There is disagreement amongst the scholars. But anyway, when we, when we translate, we have to respect the letter, particularly so that we are not interpreting the meanings in our translation. Because the interpretation of the meanings is a different type of work. The commentary on the meanings, basically, you know, exegesis, explanation, clarification, elaboration, uh, interpretation of implications, that's the work of the scholars, not the translators. So, when you, uh, and, and oftentimes we will have to basically point out the disagreement, because the implications of this hadith, according to the scholars, uh, 
uh, are variant. So some of the scholars said, La yu'min, he will not have faith. What the Prophet said, what the Prophet said, La yu'min, which means what? If you want to literally interpret this, he will say what? Not believe. He will not believe, he will not have faith, period. He will not have faith. And then you could explain that the majority of the scholars said that he will not have complete faith. He will not have complete faith. So the majority of the scholars said he will not have complete faith. But the wording of the Prophet ﷺ, la yu'min. He will not have, he will not believe, or he does not believe. He who does not love for his brother what he loves for himself. And this hadith was reported by Bukhari and Muslim from Abi Hamza Anas uh, uh, Al-Ansari radiallahu anhu, the, the servant of the uh, messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, Anas ibn Malik Al-Ansari radiallahu anhu. His kunya was Abu Hamza. So now you could probably be saying to yourself, so oh, so well, what are we going to do for the, for the next hour, talking about this hadith, it's quite obvious. One of you will not have faith until he loves for his brother, that which he loves for himself. You will say, everybody knows this hadith, so you know, let's skip it to hadith number 14 then, and talk about hadith number 14, because everybody knows it's hard. And that's when the scholars say that this is one of the hadith that manifest the qa'idah or the principle of وَمِنْ شِدَّةِ الظُّهُورِ الْخَفَاءِ or hijab al qurb مِنْ شِدَّةِ الظُّهُورِ الْخَفَاءِ is that discreteness is one of the manifestations of extreme appearance. You know, discreteness is one of the manifestations of uh, being extremely obvious that the extremely obvious will be extremely discreet. Why? Because when it is so close to you, you get desensitized. Everybody knows this hadith. So everybody fails to reflect on the hadith because everybody knows it. Because it's, everybody says it, everybody knows it. Then you skip it as if it is just, yeah, yeah. And that is what is called hijab al qurb. Hijab al qurb. Hijab is the veil. Al qurb is nearness. The veil of nearness. The veil of closeness. The veil of proximity. Basically, this here, I can't see it well. It is too close to be seen well. This hadith is too frequently said to be understood well. Too frequently uttered to be comprehended with, to be reflected upon sufficiently. Otherwise, if we truly reflect on this hadith enough, we would not be the community that we are. We would not be the ummah that we are. We would not be the people that we are. Really. The Sahaba were able to change the course of history in a few years because they were mutahabbin, mutazawireen, muta'adudin, mutanasireen, mutahabbin, loving each other, mutazawireen, used to always visit one another, muta'adudin, used to always support one another, mutanasireen, they give, they give victory to one another. They were like one body. So the Sahaba did fulfill the meaning of this hadith, لا يؤمن أحدكم حتى يحب ليفيه ما يحب لنفسه. One of you will not have faith, will not believe until he loves for his brother what he loves for himself. Do you know the story of Saad ibn Rabi'ah and Abdul Rahman ibn Auf? To tell you the difference between the Sahaba and us, now Abdul Rahman ibn Auf came to Al-Madina and the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. <laughs> you know, uh, sort of instigated this brotherhood between the Ansar and the Muhajirin, and he made Sa'd ibn Rabia and Abdul Rahman ibn Awf brothers. Sa'd ibn Rabia was the, one of the richest in Medina. 
and Abdul Rahman ibn Auf was one of the richest in Mecca. So the, the Prophet ﷺ meet the brothers. Abdul Rahman ibn Auf had left his money behind in Mecca. The 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 muhajireen, the the, the, the muhajireen, particularly the you know uh, the, the early muhajireen, they have shown the greatest example of sacrifice. So that's why they have an edge about the Ansar because of the sacrifice. The Ansar received them in their Medina, but the Muhajirin, they have left behind everything. They could not carry with them anything. They left behind everything. But the Ansar showed their Nusra and their support of the Muhajirin. So Saad ibn Rabia said, Abdul Rahman ibn Auf, I am one of the wealthiest in Medina. Now he's not hiding. You know, I have to hide this because, you know, now we will have to share with uh, with uh, our brothers in Muhajiri. So he said to them, I am the one of the wealthiest in Medina. So take half of my wealth for you, for you. And I have two wives. I will divorce one. Uh, I have two wives. Look at them and see which one you like more. And I'll divorce her so that you can marry her. Now you could say that you know, some people may say or that this is actually treating women like commodities. Absolutely not. Whoever said that the women of the Ansar were not as willing as the men of the Ansar to show support and compassion for the Muhajiri? Who would, whoever said that it is permissible in Islam for a Thayyib, a previously married woman, to be forced into a marriage that she doesn't like? By consensus, a Thayyib, a previously married woman, cannot be forced into a marriage that she doesn't like, by agreement. So we're talking about mutual agreement here. Him and his wives had mutually agreed on this. It would have been expected of an Ansariya to act this way in supporting the Muhajireen and showing you know, the utmost level of support for a Muhajireen. Things, you know, the, the, the culture could be different. Our culture could be different. For, because in our culture, the divorcee and the widow and so on, they have a different status. They have a lower status than uh, the, the rest of the women. In the culture of the Sahaba, this was untrue. This was untrue. They used to compete for the divorcees and the widows, you know, and, and, and marry them. So they were not considered the second class, or they were not considered the less than uh, the, their counterparts of the non-previously -previ married women. So what Sa'ad ibn al-Rabiya exhibited in this example is Now, we have no shortage of turbans, right? We have no shortage of beards. We have no shortage of thobes. We have no shortage of masajid, an enormous, huge masajid. We have no shortage of masahif. The Sahaba, they, they, they wrote on parchments and, you know, uh, bones and so, so on and so forth. And we decorate our masahif sometimes with, you know, uh, with gold and, and, and so on. We have no shortage of hajj and umrah. We're going back and forth and back and forth. We have no shortage of rituals in general. But we're not like them. We, we are the, the 1.4 uh, billion uh, people Ummah that is, that, 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 that is trading humanity, not leading humanity. Really trading humanity. And the Sahaba were those few people in the middle of the desert in a world that is busy with civilizations, that led that world that was busy with you know various types of civilizations, because we have the exterior of iman, we have the rituals, and we have the essence of iman, and that's what the Prophet ﷺ said in explaining this hadith in another report, in another narration, reported by Ahmad, rahimahullah <laughs> taala. So Imam Ahmad in his Musnad reported another variant uh, phrasing of this hadith from the Prophet ﷺ, in which the Prophet ﷺ said, لا يبلغ, لا يبلغ عبد حقيقة الإيمان حتى يحب للناس ما يحب لنفسه. 
لا يبلغ he will not reach عبد اسلايف حقيقة الإيمان the essence the essence حقيقة is different from الظاهر the essence the core of إيمان until he loves for the people what he loves for himself this hadith this variant report gives us insight into two different uh, meanings or implications of the hadith لا يؤمن أحدكم حتى يحب لأخيه ما يحب لنفسه one of you will not have faith until he loves for his brother what he loves for himself the first uh, you know shade of light that the, this hadith uh, adds to the other hadith لا يؤمن أحدكم حتى يحب لأخيه is that the Prophet ﷺ told us what he meant by لا يؤمن he does not believe he said لا يبلغ عبد حقيقة الإيمان one will not reach the true essence of faith true essence of faith until he loves for his brother until he loves for the people, the people what, he what he loves for himself and that is the other benefit from this report but first let's talk about the first benefit which is that, that what is meant by an Iman here is the essence of Iman is the essence of Iman Haqiqat al-Iman the core of Iman you will not have true 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 faith until you love for your brother what you love for yourself and why, why is this? why is this? people who compete for this dunya are, are people who are completely heedless of the hereafter if you're really heedful of the hereafter and the pleasure of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala you will not be competing for this dunya and it is our competition for this dunya that is making us not love for our brothers what we love for ourselves because if we're competing for the mercy of Allah the mercy of Allah is so 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 vast that there is no crowdedness here no crowdedness you want to compete for the mercy of Allah? Yes, compete with your brother for the mercy of Allah like Abu Bakr or Omar competed. But the mercy of Allah as in Surah al and in that let them compete, concerning that let them compete. The mercy of Allah is so vast that our competition in, for the mercy of Allah will be in parallel lines, not in intersecting lines. The vastness of it will not create conflict and friction because the mercy of Allah is so vast, I can get of it as much as I want, and you get of it as much as you want without crowdedness. But the finite resources in this dunya and the infinite grief in our hearts is what is making us compete and not and want to come on top. Because if you don't come on top, you get less. The one who comes on top gets more, and the one who comes second gets less, and you want to get more. But one who is heedful of the meaning of this dunya will not be competing for this dunya. One who understands the core, the, the true, the, the, the essence of faith and iman will be one who is focused on the hereafter and the pleasure of Allah. And whatever he does in this dunya will do it to support his mission for the, the journeying back to Allah, journeying back to the first abode, going back to our hometown which is al Jannah. So that, that's the only focus. I want to go back to home. I want to go back to al Jannah. My only focus. Should, will I be competing while, I, while I'm crossing this bridge over to my destination, my, my hometown? Absolutely not. Competing for a spot on the bridge? Don't worry about spots on the bridge. Your hometown is not here. You still have some way, a long way to go back to your hometown. So one, that is why. If you truly have faith, you would really not have this competition that will make you want to come on top, ahead of your brother. But if you truly have faith and you're heedful of the hereafter, and the pleasure of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is your main concern and focus, Whoever said that there will be crowdedness in Jannah, that you want to come on top? There will not be crowdedness in Jannah. So the, the, the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is so vast. So we will be able to compete in parallel lines, not in intersecting lines, without conflict, without friction, 
without resentment, without hard feelings. So that, so that is the, the, the meaning of reaching the essence of Iman. Because if you reach the essence of Iman, you, you will want everybody to join you uh, and to, to reach that, uh, the, the pleasure of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and to earn the mercy of Allah which is so vast and can include us all. One of the other things also that are important here to, to, you know, to keep in mind is that true, reaching the true essence of Iman means that you have purified your heart from all of the bad qualities that devour Iman. There are four different qualities sitting inside your heart that will devour Iman. Those are the qualities that will make you not love for your brother what you love for yourself. What are those? A group of qualities called the Sifat al bahimiyya the characteristic, characteristics of, or the qualities of, cattle. Cattle. A group of qualities called the Sifat al sabuiyya the characteristics of predators, predatorial qualities. A group of qualities called as Sifat al shaytaniyya satanic qualities and a group of qualities called as-sifat al-malikiyya or some of the scholars say al-rabbaniyya which is basically to claim rububiyya, to claim, you know, uh, lordship. Okay, one of them leads to the other. One of them leads to the other. And truly, if you don't purge those qualities out of your heart, you will never love for your brother what you love for yourself and there, therefore you will never have true faith. You will never enjoy your faith. You will never taste the sweetness of faith. Safat al bahimiyya the qualities of cattle, cattle qualities, would be al-hirs, wal-shahwa, wal-naham. It is eagerness. It is keenness. It's lust. So, it, mainly it is eagerness for money, eagerness for wealth, eagerness for food, eagerness for lust, you know, lustful desires. And now, these are Sifat al-Bihmiya, like cattle. cattle. All what cattle think about is, you know, the, those pleasures, food and sexual lust and so on. That's what cattle are concerned with about. So those are the Sifat al-Bahimiyya. They lead to, they lead to a Sifat al sabuiyya predatorial qualities, predators, predatorial qualities. Why? Because like I said, this world is not vast like the mercy of Allah. It's limited. It's, it's finite, it has finite resources. And this crowdedness, our keenness, our eagerness creates this crowdedness and we're competing for finite resources with infinite greed. And that will result in us being predatorial. al babi al udwan basically aggression, transgression, zulm. These are all predatorial qualities that we have in our hearts that are devouring our faith. They resulted from our Sifat al bahimiyya that we act like cattle, like we want to have more and more and more. And you want to have more and there is competition and there is limitations, so you become predatory. You want to push your, your you know, the other, you know, animal or cattle or human being, push them away. So you become aggressive, aggressive and you transgress. These are... Some. Now, there is, shaitan was given some powers, you know, over us. They are not absolute. Keep in mind, they are not absolute. And whoever seeks Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Allah will give him power over the shaitan if they seek Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But the shaitan was given some tools, some, you know, keys to our heart. So he is there. He goes through the son of Adam like the blood goes through the vessel. And he is using all of those sifat to add to them, to add fuel to those sifat or those qualities of cattle and predators. Now we get into 
غش خديعة you know, uh, غل حسد انفي حسد uh, غش cheating خديعة deception مكر plotting all of these are صفات شيطانية you know predatorial animals are not really that deceptive and they, they are not that envious you know they have the صفات البهيمية the cat of like qualities and in addition to this they are also predatorial but they are not as deceptive as us human beings they are not as treacherous traitors they don't plot like we so we went beyond them so we got some qualities from the Baha'im, the cattle, some qualities from the Sibar, the predators, and went, we went beyond them with this Sifat al-Shaytaniyya, a result of the Shaytan going through, uh, you know... Uh, the Shaytan was not satisfied with this. Shaytan was not satisfied with this. Did the Shaytan ever say to anyone, Ana Rabbukum al-A'la, I am your Supreme Lord? The Shaytan himself, did he ever say that? What does the shaitan swear by? By Allah only. By your might. You know, sifatullah, the attributes of Allah. And the shaitan never said, Ana Rabbukum al But some human beings do say that. So the shaitan used all of those sifat to bring us to the worst level whatsoever, which is to compete with Allah Himself. Now we're done competing with the creation. You know, the keenness, eagerness, and so on, and we became predatorial, and then we have, we, we went beyond the seba or the predatorial animals with the deception and plotting and so on, and now some of us have this kibr, this, this, this arrogance that some express clearly, like, you know, some of the, and, and you know, we don't have, it's not just limited to those examples. It's not just limited to Fir'aun. Whoever feels this way, whoever feels complete and perfect, he is saying, whoever feels, you know, like those, you know, I, I heard this myself from one of the plastic surgeons. He's, he was saying that I just correct his mistakes. Who's, who he's referring to? Allah subhanahu he's referring to God. I'm just correcting his mistakes. So in, in, now, now the, the, this person had gone beyond the Sibel, beyond the cattle, beyond the Sibel, beyond the Shaitan, beyond the Shaitan. Because the Shaitan was, was debating with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, but he was never this vulgar with Allah. He was never this rude with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He was always talking about, I would do that to them, I would do that to them. But he never was confrontational with Allah himself. Anyway, why is he will not have why is it that he will not have faith until he loves for his brother what he loves for himself? Why is this the whole mark of having faith? Because he will not love for his brother what he loves for himself until he purged those qualities out of his heart. And now he will have perfect faith. You cannot, no matter what. Even if you were the best person without faith in God, you will not be able to purge those qualities out of your heart if you're just being like a good neighbor, a nice person. And the, without sincere effort, guided by Allah, seeking the pleasure of Allah, you're not gonna be able to get there. You're not going to be, you're not gonna be able to get there. So, لا يؤمن أحدكم حتى يحب اليتيم ويحب نفسه and we see now the relationship between iman and يحب اليتيم ويحب النفس. Now, حتى يحب اليتيم ويحب النفس. We said that the report by Imam Ahmad showed us or added two different uh, benefits to the report of Al Bukhari and Muslim. One of the benefits is that it said Hakim al Iman, the essence of Iman. So now we know what the Prophet ﷺ is talking about when he says La Yu'min. He's talking about Hakikat al Iman. He's not talking about the exterior of Iman, the crust of Iman, the peel of Iman. So I said that we like 
before I move on to the next uh, one, I said that we don't have shortage of beers and turbans and so on and so forth. Am I meaning to be little those rituals, Hajj and Umrah and Masajid and Masahif, am I meaning to be little those rituals? Absolutely not. But some people get stuck there and they don't go beyond this and they have no work on their interior whatsoever. And in this case, those rituals will be empty, void. Your salah will not get you closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Your salah will not get you closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Your, your recitation of the Mus'haf is not, if you're not acting upon it, if you're not reflecting upon it and you're not acting upon it, will be void of benefit. If you, it, it will be Allah's plea against you. You know, you know Mus'haf, you know Qur'an, you memorize the Qur'an, that's Allah's hujj against you, if you don't act upon it. Those rituals, the external rituals of faith, the manifestations, external manifestations of faith, all of the acts, you know, of the body and so on, external manifestations of faith, some of them are obligatory, some of them are mustahab, and some of them are permissible. And we said some of them are not part of the deen. This turban is not part of the deen. Why do we wear it? It is basically reminiscent of our Mashaykh. It is to show compassion for our Prophet ﷺ, that we're imitating him, even though it is not part of the deed, we're imitating him. It is basically holding on to identity. It's, it's, but it is not part of the deed. It is, it is not part of the deed. But if you, if you stop there, you know, at the turban, or the soul, or the beard, or any of those good manifestations, I am saying good, some of them are obligatory, some of them are mustahab, some of them are not, are, are, are preferred or mubah. And, you know, so, so the, whatever category they fall in, then we respect that. And we certainly understand that the, the exterior affects the interior as well. The exterior does have an impact on the interior. It's a bilateral relationship. It's, it's, it's a bilateral relationship. We're not belittling the exterior whatsoever. Whatever was left behind for us in the Quran or the Sunnah of the Prophet ﷺ, we honor it all, we respect it all, we uh, take it seriously all. But we're saying if you stop there and you don't delve a little bit inside, in, in, inside your heart and work on your interior, then you're not reaching the essence of faith, the core of faith that has the sweetness. The orange has a peel. Important part of the orange is the peel, isn't it? But it, the sweetness is inside. The sweetness is inside. So all of those exterior manifestations, if you do not take them to get you to, you know, to the purification of your interior, then you're not making good use out of them. And in this case, لَن تَبْلُقَ حَقِيقَةَ iman, You will not reach the essence of faith. The other benefit from the riwayah of Imam Ahmad is that he said, النَّاسِ not أَخِيهِ Right? حَتَّى يُحِبَّ لِلنَّاسِ not hatta yuhibbali Because if he said, if it is only if the riwayat were all li akhihi, then he would have said only Muslims, applies only to Muslims. Or we could have said that. Keep in mind that when any hadith that talks about akhihi in the context of justice applies to all people without a doubt. In, in the context of justice. Like you do not do injustice to your brother. In the context of, you know, the, 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 the rules of transactions, it should apply to all the people. In the context of justice, without doubt, it should apply to all people. But in the context of etiquettes of proper transactions, it does still, according to the stronger position, apply to all people. Like, one of you should not outbid his brother and say, that applies to all people. That applies to all people. Akhi, in general, when it is mentioned, it means Akhi in Islam. But sometimes there are signs, there are signs that it means Akhi in humanity, his brother in humanity. What would be the signs? If it is a matter of justice, then it is certainly his brother in humanity. Then it is certainly his brother in humanity. 
And you could, said, you could say that what is meant here is his brother in humanity. Or you could say that the Prophet said, Akhi, which is Akhi in Islam, not to say that it does not include the rest of humanity, but to, to basically show us how evil that would look like. You know, when the Prophet says, لا يبع أحدكم على بيعي أخي One of you should not outbid his brother and say, it is to, to underscore the ugliness of this practice. Are you outbidding your brother and say, but not to say that you should, that you may outbid someone who is not Muslim and say, it is just to show the ugliness of it, but it is ap applicable to Muslims and to non-Muslims, as Subki said in his Majmu'ah uh, and other scholars, in, in his explanation, you know, uh, basically uh, addendum to al Majmu'ah by al Nawawi and other scholars indicated as well, that this is mentioned not to rule out others that are not Muslim, but rather to show the ugliness of this if you outbid uh, your brother. But since it is ugly, you don't do it with anyone. Since it is ugly, you do not do it with anyone. Here in this hadith, alhamdulillah, we don't only have one report that says akhi, and then we would be debating whether this is akhi in, in humanity or akhi in, in uh, Islam. We have multiple reports. Imam Muslim's report from Anas himself, the Prophet ﷺ said, حَتَّى يُحِبَّ لِجَارِهِ مَا يُحِبُّ لِنَفْسِهِ uh, or the Afi, the Jari or the Afi, until he loves for his neighbor what he loves for himself. And his neighbor could be Muslim or not Muslim. This report from an Imam Ahmad, this report from an Imam Ahmad, حَتَّى يُحِبَّ لِلنَّاسِ مَا يُحِبُّ لِنَفْسِهِ until he loves for the people what he loves for himself. There is also another hadith uh, reported by Imam Muslim from Abdullah ibn Amr ibn al-As, reported by Muslim from Abdullah ibn Amr ibn al-As, in which the Prophet ﷺ said, فَمَنْ أَرَادَ أَنْ يُزَحْزَحَ عَنِ النَّارِ وَيُدْخَلَ الْجَنَّةِ فَلَا تَأْتِهِ مَنِيَّتُهُ إِلَّا وَهُوَ يؤمن بالله واليوم الآخر وليأتي إلى الناس ما يحب أن يؤتى إليه. So he who wants to be removed, pushed away from pushed away from النار and admitted into الجنة يزحز عن النار ويدخل الجنة أو يدخل الجنة. Enter into the Jannah or admitted into the Jannah. فَمَنْ أَرَادَ أَنْ يُزَحْزَحَ عَنِ النَّارِ To be pushed away from النار and admitted into the Jannah فَلَا تَأْتِهِ مَنِيَّتُهُ Let death not, let death not come to him فَلَا تَأْتِهِ مَنِيَّتُهُ Let his death not come to him إِلَّا وَهُوَ يُؤْمِنُ بِاللَّهِ وَيَوْمِ الْآخِرِ Except while believing in Allah in the final day الْيَوْمِ الْآخِرِ وَلْيَأْتِ إِلَى النَّاسِ And let him extend to all people, and nas here. Not he, let him extend to all people that which he would like to receive from them. That which he would like to receive from them. So this is a golden rule. This is a golden rule. But reflect on this rule. The problem is, is, is that we don't really reflect enough. We, you know, we should have more study circles where we truly spend a little bit of time pausing and reflecting. And the speaker does not have to always be engaging, you know, like speaking, speaking, speaking quickly and eloquently so that he is grasping the attention of everybody. We should just pause and reflect on real applications, like day-to-day -day applications. Because we always say, Ya ibadi inni haram to thulma ala nafsi wa ja'altu ubaylakum muharraman fala tazalam. All my servants, I made injustice forbidden upon myself, and I make it forbidden amongst you, so do not be unjust to one another. But we're always doing injustice to each other. And we're always saying the hadith, and we're always doing injustice to each other. So there is a break, there is a disconnect. Is that we're not reflecting on what injustice is. So basically, when you take my turn in line, 
I don't know, I mean, it's, this is America. Uh, see, I need examples because I grew up in Egypt. So I, I bring my examples from Egypt. Uh, so when you're standing in line for food or something, because in Egypt you stand in line to get... Even here, you stand in line. If you check out from a grocery store or something, you stand in line. But in Egypt, the lines are bigger, longer. <laughs> so when someone, you know, pushes their way in, in front of the lion or something, that is a form of injustice that prayful people do not recognize. That you have done injustice to like 26 or 7 people standing in the line. Because my turn is my right. Right or wrong? You, it, it's, it is time. You're wasting my time. My turn is my right. But our awareness has been too contracted that we think injustice is to make you bleed, is to actually, you know, wound you and, and, and make you bleed, or to, to take your money out of your pocket or something like this. But I can trick you as much as I want in transactions, in sales, or whatever transactions. I can use the worst work ethics with you. I could use the worst, you know, uh, basically business ethics with you, and we do this often as Muslims, right? It's actually that we've become so, like, uh, averse to one another, right? Because, you know, you, you don't want to be working for a Muslim employer. He's just not going to pay you, and they're just going to give you, like, right or wrong. We do say this or not. It is sad, it is sad and, and really shameful. But I hear this from a lot of people. You know, I hear this from so, from so many people. How could, how, could, how, could they, how could we get there? Because basically, we're about technicalities. You know, you, you, you want the, well, technicalities to affect, and you go to your own mufti and tell him the story. If you're practicing, if you're good enough, You'll be going to your mufti and telling the story, and so this is the business dealing between me, me and my friend, and so on. And he did this, and then I did that. And he, he, once you, you basically you grab the fatwa out of the mufti, uh, then you run with it, and, and, and then you use it. But this hadith, it, you know, should, should give us a different perspective on the whole issue. <laughs> None of you will have faith until he loves for his brother what he loves for himself. Until he loves for his brother. If you are a physician, if you are a physician, you will even study harder because you, you treat people, right? You want to treat, how, how would you like to be treated? By ignorant physicians? By reckless physicians? No. And if you love for your brother what you, or for the people what you love for yourself, then you're going to want to make sure that you are the best physician so that when you treat people, you're extending to the people that which you want to receive from them. It, it, it is just as simple as that. In everything you do, you are aware of this meaning. فَلَا تَأْتِيهِ مَنِ يَتْمُوا إِلَّا وَهُوَ يُحِبُّ اللَّهَ إِلَّا وَهُوَ يُؤْمِنُ بِاللَّهِ وَالْيَوْمِ الْآخِرِ let death not come to him except while having faith in Allah on the final day and let him extend to the people that which he likes to receive from them in every regard, in everything you should do this otherwise you will not have faith I, I heard this example from one of our Mashaif he said if you you know, if you, if you walk, walk out of your apartment building and you find the neighbor's, uh, neighbor's kids or kid or child, and then you, you slap one of the kids of the neighbor. For some reason, you just get into an argument with the kid and you slap one of the kids of the neighbors. Or the other scenario, the other scenario, you, you're walking by the beach and you find one of the kids' neighbors or a stream of water, Torah, beach, anything. You're walking by and you find one of the kids of the neighbors drowning. And you jump in and you, you, you rescue them. 
Okay. Now, the next time you see those two neighbors, yeah, is that going to be the same? The neighbor that you slapped in the fa face of his child and the neighbor that you rescued his child from drowning? Are you going to be feeling the same? Is, is the interaction between you and the neighbor going to be the same? Aren't the, the creation, the people, all of the creation, the dependence of Allah? Isn't He his, their Lord, their Rabb, their Master, their caretaker? He is their caretaker. You know, even Rabb al Bayt, the caretaker of the household, took the word Rabb from Rububiyyah. And Allah is the Rabb of, of all the creation. Well, Khalqu Allah and the creation are the dependence of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So basically, when you shortchange his ayat, his dependence, when you transgress his dependence, when you humiliate or insult his dependence, how could you stand in prayer and meet him? How, how would you feel about the next prayer when you have wronged his dependence? Just like your neighbor, and to Allah belongs the, great, the most perfect example. But just like your neighbor, are, how are you going to face Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the prayer after you have done this to his uh, creation or his dependence? Anyway, one of you will not have faith until he loves for his brother what he loves for himself. In one report by uh, Mu'adh in Musnad al-Imam Ahmad, وَيَكْرَهَا حَتَّى يُحِبَّ لِلنَّاسِ مَا يُحِبُّ لِنَفْسِهِ وَيَكْرَهَا لِلنَّاسِ مَا يَكْرَهُ لِنَفْسِهِ And until he dislikes for the people what he dislikes for himself. But this is obvious from the first hadith, until he loves for the people what he loves for himself. Now, in order for us to, to, to get there, we said that one of the things that we need to do is actually to sit down and reflect. Do, do you have examples of how you could exhibit this? How could you exhibit nowadays? Examples. Do you have any like good stories about any of one of us who did something that really shows how he loves for? Not necessarily about. If it is about yourself, just say X person. <laughs> How about the, there was one story? I mean, not from the time of the Sahaba. We want to we want to uplift our spirits a little bit. And, because we, every, uh, you know, we always talk about the time of the Sahaba. We want to have any contemporary examples that show. We're not talking about Sa'd ibn Rabi'a and Abdul Rahman ibn Auf. I, I challenge you that you're not going to have this example in our times. <laughs> we're talking about things that are a little humbler than this. Yes, sir. There's a story on the news where uh, there was a Muslim on the bus and there was a homeless man sitting next to him and he gave him his shoes and told him, I don't need them. Uh, yes, yeah. This was in the UK. Yeah. Yeah. So this the, this was really a beautiful story, and it it made it to the news. So if we really do good work, it will still make it to the news. You know, it's not going to make it as bad work, and it's not going to make it to Fox or <laughs> CNN. <laughs> Maybe a little bit to CNN sometimes, but anyway. But the, the, so this Muslim fellow was sitting on the bus, and he, the the guy next to him. He was, he was not particularly Muslim, but he was homeless, and he had no shoes. So that Muslim brother, who was, he, he was wearing a thobe as well, uh, and for, from the UK, and so he took off his shoes and socks and gave them discreetly, very nice, discreetly to, to the guy, the homeless guy. And then the homeless guy said, well, how are you going to make it home? He said, don't worry about me, my home is, is nearby. And he got off. He got off the bus. So a Sikh person uh, saw this and he taped it. And he went to the, you know, so that was some, really did it so discreetly and did not want any credit for it. But a Sikh person who was on the bus saw this and, you know, you know, caught it on video and took it to the media. So they were able to trace the Muslim down to that community and they actually spoke with the Imam. 
uh, but but the, the brother himself did not want to take credit or to be mentioned, uh, his name to be mentioned. So it was very beautiful. Uh, so the, the final thing that I wanted to say is that in order for us to have this level of love, we really need to, we really need to work for it to realize it. We start with uh, this community. We start with this masjid. We start with this community. And we have to have some practical steps towards the realization of this love amongst ourselves. The first thing is ta'aruf, brothers, is to know one another, is to get to know one another a little better. Because I, you know, I, I try to, inshallah, we'll try to do this a little bit more often. But I found two brothers here that were engineers and know each other's name. And they give salam to each other every day. You know, and I, I, I'm not, you know, saying that this is peculiar to our community. This is in every masjid. But this should not be really a case. So they were both engineers and they were given, to, they were you know, of the brothers that frequent the masjid. And they know each other by name. And they were sitting next to, next to each other. But guess what? I, I, I discovered that they did not know that they were engineers. That both of them are in the same field. So ta'aruf should not be limited to knowing the names and the faces. Although this is important and saying salamu alaikum and smiling, but did you know that my son is sick and in the hospital so that he could actually come and visit? Did you know that you know I work in IT and I have been laid off for the last three months or so and you have some job at your place? And you should love for me what you love for yourself, and you should work for, you know, you know if you don't have a, 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 a job in your company, you should be looking for me. I am your brother, and we both work in IT, and you may have some access. So ta'aruf should be a little bit more in depth than what we think of ta'aruf. You know, recognizing faces and putting names to faces, if we do that. Because sometimes some of us don't do that and don't care enough to do that, to, to recognize the, the brothers and to recognize names and put names to faces and so on. But really, we, we should make sure, so joint activities, we will have inshallah, particularly when we move to the new place. Any updates on Ramir? Yeah, this is still on track for before Ramadan, inshallah. So uh, there will be more, you know, more chances for us to have uh, like joint activities to come together and uh, uh, have lunch together, have breakfast together, and so on, and potlucking and, and and just really like acting like the one family because well, the Prophet ﷺ wanted of us more than that, more than one family. He wanted one body. Hadith in Nu'man ibn Bashir. The likeness of the believers and their compassion, you know, tawadihim, their compassion for one another, watarahumihim, their mercy, watarahumihim, and their sympathy for one another is like one body, not one family, like one body. When one part of it, one organ, you know, uh, is, uh, is sick, the rest of the body sympathizes with insomnia and fever, with insomnia and fever. So inshallah, we should be working, this should be our aspiration as a community, we should be working for this goal, but we should take practical steps towards this goal. So make sure that when you come and you see your brother, just ask him his name, next time you ask him where do they work and what do they do, and, and so on, next time you ask him, how many kids do you have, and where do you live, and and so on and so forth, and build up the ta'aruf uh, so that we could strengthen the relationship between the believers within the community, uh, within the community of this masjid, community of Central New Jersey, community of New Jersey, and the whole Ummah.
اللهم لا حق حقا وارزقنا اتباعه وارنا الباطل باطلا وارزقنا اجتنابه اللهم لا تسلط علينا بذنوبنا ومن لا يخفف علينا ارحمنا اللهم انك عفو تحب العفو فاعف عنا ربنا اتي نفوسنا تقواها وزكيها انت خير من زكاها انت وليها ومولاها اللهم اصلح بين قلوبنا اللهم الف بين قلوبنا واصلح ذات بيننا واجمعنا على الحق والخير اللهم اجمعنا على الحق والخير وارزقنا رضاك والجنة اللهم ارزقنا رضاك والجنة ربنا من ازواجنا وذرياتنا قرة اعين واجعلنا للمتقين اماما ربنا هب لنا من ازواجنا وذرياتنا قرة اعين واجعلنا للمتقين اماما ربنا اوزعنا ان نشكر نعمتك التي انعمت علينا وعلى والدينا وان نعمل صالحا ترضاه واصلح لنا في ذرياتنا انا تبنا اليك وانا من المؤمنين واخر دعوانا الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاه والسلام على اشرف المرسلين